But I'd like to talk about a case that finally went to trial this year. I think it was delayed over 10 times. Jan Necessary was the prosecutor, and uh, Ralph Scundrich uh, was a, a serial rapist who, once his DNA was on CODIS, began lighting up the whole East Coast, and I ended up testifying uh, for the prosecution, both in Butler County as well as Allegheny County last year. So, in brief, the story is that on July 25th of 2002, a uh, Pittsburgh college student, 18 years old, uh, was threatened with a gun and sexually assaulted in some very graphic ways in her shady side apartment. The victim's jeans and t-shirts contained biological evidence. Now that's important. This isn't like a vaginal swab or from a body cavity. This is clothing and this will become more of a theme. And then the Allen County Crime Lab developed DNA data using these STR, short tandem repeat methods, from the two evidence items. And it sat for a while because there was no suspect, but Scundrich was identified as a suspect um, after a DNA match was made to the CODIS uh, database in 2009. He was there on a forgery charge. Mr. Scundrich was both a white and blue collar criminal. He had all sorts of interesting crimes. Okay, this is what the data looks like from the genes at one of the 13 STR locations that were looked at. So on the horizontal x-axis, this is the length of the paragraph. How many words are in this, how many letters are in this DNA paragraph? The numbers on top correspond to how many times the repeated word appears in tandem. 8, 11, 12, 14. So those are the alleles, and you can see a difference in height between the two left peaks, which are very tall, and the two right peaks on the bottom, which are very short, and the scale on the left, the vertical scale, for the peak height is in relative fluorescence units that shows the different amounts of DNA that was amplified. So just by looking at this, if you're familiar with DNA, you say, well, uh, since there are equal amounts of DNA, in each cell from a genotype, from the two alleles, maybe this pair of alleles, the 8 and 11, came from one person, because they have equal quantities, roughly, of uh, the pair of alleles in the person's genotype from the first person, and that lower amount might be from a second person. And that would be a good hypothesis. You'd have to establish it with more science, but that, was, that would be an initial guess if you were looking at this. And so we were sent the data at Cybergenetics, which is down in Oakland, where we have computers uh, that do this. And in a computer view station that's a very visual machine, the data were entered, uh, the data were uploaded to our database server, and then computers spent hours asking each of several different questions that we asked about the two evidence items. Assume that there are two unknown people present then the computer can separate them and solve for it. Once you've established uh, definitively that the, the larger component came from the victim, we did go back and ask again, assume the victim's present, find the other genotype that's unknown. So these are the sort of questions that we ask the computer. When it's done thinking, it writes its answers back onto the server computer. It hasn't seen who we're making the comparison with, so the process is completely objective, and it doesn't suffer from the sort of bias that uh, people write about for forensic and uh, mixture interpretation. And after those objective genotypes are written down, then the true allele operator, who's using our true allele software, then can make a comparison between the inferred genotypes that have been separated out from the mixture up to probability against reference samples like the victim and uh, Mr. Scundrich in order to determine match statistics. Uh, this is how the computer thinks. The computer uses a type of modern statistics which I won't go into today, which you should be relieved at, unless you're a very special sort of attorney. It's something called hierarchical Bayesian modeling, uh, which is used in almost every field of science and social science and economics, Google, forecasting, stock markets. It's how you infer the values or probabilities of variables and there can be, in physics, there can be millions of variables. In social sciences, it's more like maybe dozens of variables. For the DNA problems, there are hundreds of variables. 
because the computer wants to figure out not just the genotypes, but the relative quantities and all the uncertainties, various distortions and so on. So there's a probability model, it's a Bayesian model, and the computer solves this by a statistical sampling known as Markov chain Monte Carlo, which I won't talk about today. But what it does is it uses some math that's about 100 years old that became very popular in statistics uh, maybe 25 years ago. And it can solve these statistical problems in high dimensions by random sampling. You can think of it as the new calculus. What Newton came up with 350 years ago was great in those courses you didn't take for uh, one or two variables, but maybe your kids do. And what happens when there's more than three or four variables and there's probability equations and there's hundreds of them? Then you go to statistical sampling because computers are really good at those sorts of problems. So what the computer does in this random sampling is it tries out different possibilities. It tries out possibilities of genotypes where the data are, where the data aren't, possibilities that explain the data well, possibilities of genotypes and their combinations that explain them poorly. It doesn't care. It's trying to try out everything. And those explanations that are better end up with higher probability. So here's what an explanation looks like. Suppose the computer proposes that at alleles 8 and 9, that's the genotype from one person who's 90% of the mix. And it proposes at the same time that there's another individual whose genotype, whose allele pair, is a 12 and a 14, and an orange, and they're 10% of the mix. That pattern, if you look at the heights of the blue rectangles that are being proposed, and the data peaks underneath, match the pattern. They explain it very well. So those genotypes would get a higher probability. If you change the genotype, suppose you proposed um, an 8 and a 9, but not an 11, then you're trying to put a big rectangle where there is no data, you're leaving the data unexplained, that would get lower probability. So the computer tries out tens of thousands of these possibilities at all the different locations. And when it's done, it arrives at a probability distribution. That is, what is the genotype for each location, each loci, each locus, for each of the contributors? So in this case, there are two contributors, and there are 13 locations. And this is the evidence genotype at that D13 location for the minor contributor, the one that looks like he's in there at 10%. Uh, the one that's 90% actually uh, easily matches and corresponds to the victim. So the computer's trying to pull out this 10% component with very low peaks. And of the 100 or so possible genotypes, possible allele pairs, it says the uh, 12, 14, really looks like what's most probable. In other words, it's saying this pattern is really governing what we're seeing. There isn't any other way. If you swap the orange and the blue here, you're just not explaining the data. If you put a little peak, a little explanation there, it was a low height at allele 11 and a tall one at 12, that's just wrong. So virtually all the probability is placed on this low genotype of a 12 and a 14, and that's what the computer derives for each of the two contributors at every locus. And now it's done inferring genotypes and it writes its answer down. When it's finished writing its answer down, we now need to produce a match statistic. Why? Because usually people don't go to court without a match statistic. If you have a lot of people in a mixture, it could basically be almost anybody and anybody could be included. And so the, it's not that germane, it's like almost anybody could be in a mixture if there's enough people. What is the strength of match? What is the chance of this outcome that we're seeing relative to coincidence? And that's what's done in a, in a ratio that's called a likelihood ratio. So, so I have to ask, who's seen The Imitation Game? There's this great movie about Alan Turing and how he saves shortens the war by a year or something in World War, v war, World war II by using computer, computers, the first computers that were ever built were at that time in order to break the German Enigma code, in order to figure out what the naval instructions were to direct uh, the German ships. And a lot of ethical issues involved but of not giving away the, the, the store that they knew, but they were able to pretty much know what the, what the movements were from the German Navy using this. And in the movie, there's a moment where somebody walks in, his name is Jack Good, 
And for the six people in the U.S. who know the history of the likelihood ratio, it was very exciting because he's the person who then wrote the book about the likelihood ratio that was used to help put the best guesses into the computer. They only had a day to solve the problem each day. And if they had, didn't have other information of what were good guesses, they could make a bad guess and they wouldn't find anything. But they could use likelihood ratios. Likelihood ratios have an interesting property in that they're completely focused on the data and they remove prior prejudices. So they, it, they're not quite a balancing test, but it's interesting in that the way they operate is they're very probative on trying to explain the data and they remove prior assumptions. For example, any prior assumption of guilt or innocence is removed from likelihood ratios, the way they're constructed. And they teach them in law schools as well. So this is a likelihood ratio. And what the likelihood ratio does is it takes this probability distribution, which is a genotype. This is, this is the genotype. The genotype is 12, 14, 98% probability, other possibilities with lower probabilities. And now what's going to happen is the likelihood ratio is going to answer the question about match information. How much more does the suspect match the evidence than a random person? And the way that's done is of all the possibilities that could be there, we now know for the first time that the suspect, Mr. Skundrich, has a 1214 genotype. That's his allele pair at this location on chromosome 13. And so now all the focus is just here. And what we see is the evidence genotype that was separated out, the blue bar, is a lot taller than the brown bar, which is coincidence. If we were comparing against somebody else who maybe had an 11 and a 12, the coincidence probability, shown in brown, is a lot higher than the evidence that would give an exclusionary value at this location. But in this case, it just happens to be the case that when the comparison's made, there's an inc support for an inclusion, and simply by dividing the height of that probability of the genotype at this location for that second small 10% contributor by the chance of a coincidence shown in, in brown, that 99% divided by 3% is around 35%, that is the match statistic at this locus. It works just like it does for single source uncomplicated DNA, but accounting for uncertainty. That's what it is mathematically. If you want to know why, I can refer you to a lot of articles, but visually you can see the blue is a lot taller than the brown. And that's support for his having contributors DNA. There it is on, on the top left, D13. Here's the match information at 13 locations. That match statistic or likelihood ratio is on the x-axis, extending from one out to over 100. And the vertical axis is listing the 13 locations. And because these are independent locations in the human genome, these numbers are independent by the product rule mathematically, and they can therefore mathematically and legally be multiplied together. And the product of those 13 numbers, uh, which are mainly around 10 or 20, some are larger, some are smaller, the product is a number. And that number in this case was in the quadrillions. So to answer the question, is the suspect in the evidence, from combining this information, we can state in the same sort of plain English that we have for non-mixture, single source, simple DNA, that a match between the genes and Ralph Skundrich is 2.1 quadrillion times more probable than a coincidence. That's a lot of weighted evidence. Uh, studies have been done by social scientists like Jay Kohler that show once the numbers over a thousand, juries start to believe it. Once it's over a million, they're persuaded. That has nothing to do with the science, that's just the psychology that's been studied by legal scholars. Now we can also look at the other item of evidence, the t-shirt. We see that a match between the t-shirt and Ralph Skundrich is four quadrillion times more probable than coincidence. So in Allegheny County, Mr. Skundrich uh, was convicted. He was sentenced to 75 to 150 years for that rape. Uh, there are others in other county, counties and other states. Jan Necessary's comment was, this case was solved on DNA alone. There's no way he would have been identified otherwise. And Judge David Cashman spoke to the defendant and told him, you need to be removed from society and you are incapable of being rehabilitated. Your days of torturing women are over. 